pressure looks good. Episode of NASA Spaceflight Live, episode 14 of our weekly news show. My name is Thomas Burkhardt. I am a writer slash reporter slash webcast host for NASA Spaceflight, and I am joined by the pair of Chris's from NASA Spaceflight. I've got Chris Bergen up top and Chris Gebhardt, managing editor and assistant managing editor of nasaspaceflight.com. And we have got a very busy week in space news to talk about. We're going to be looking at the first of three Mars missions launching in 2020, the Alamal mission from the United Arab Emirates. Uh, we're going to be talking about Boeing Starliner and NASA's recently completed investigation into OFT and how Starliner is going to be moving forward this year. We're also going to talk about an important anniversary of the final shuttle mission, which I know the two shuttle huggers above me is going to love to talk about. Um, and then, of course, like every week, we're going to give you the very latest out of SpaceX Boca Chica with Starship. Lots of very cool things to talk about. If you have questions at any point during the show, please put them in the chat we'll be talking about those as well um, and if it doesn't pertain to what we're talking about at that exact moment we'll come back to it later do some max q a at the end um, but for now let's uh, introduce everyone chris chris and chris how are you guys doing uh, good evening doing well how's everyone out there doing as well I think we're all doing good and excited to have another busy week of space news to talk about. First up on the agenda, we're going to go to Chris B., who's going to talk about the first official mission of Mars season 2020. Chris, go ahead. It's actually Chris G., isn't it? Uh, is, is it? I've got Chris B. I mean, whoever wants to talk about it, go ahead. Let's all talk about it. Yeah, let's all talk yeah. about it. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so this is this is a, this is a nice, rather large mission. Um, it is the first interplanetary voyage for the United Arab Emirates. Um, it will launch on a Japan H-2A rocket from the Tanegashima Space Center in southern Japan. Uh, opening of the launch window is on Tuesday, the 14th, at 6:51 and 27 seconds Eastern Daylight Time. That is a photograph of the Alamal spacecraft, which translates into hope in the Arabic language. And that is a uh, picture of it uh, getting installed onto the uh, payload dispenser and the payload decoupler prior to the encapsulation uh, that it underwent um, earlier this month prior to being hoisted atop the H-2A rocket in its integration facility. Now, what's notable is that, uh, and, and a nice little coincidence here, is that uh, if we if this mission does launch in the current window, and there you can see the first stage of the H-2A rocket being uh, hoisted up onto its mobile launch platform there in the integration building. But a nice thing about this mission is that um, if it does launch in this year's Mars transfer window in July, it will arrive in February of 2021, and which actually coincides with the 50th anniversary of the founding of the United Arab Emirates. So a nice little way to celebrate the 50th anniversary of that nation's founding and also showing a large step forward in technological achievement. And of course, for the United Arab Emirates, this actually comes as a um, this actually comes on the heels of last year when they launched their first astronaut um, into orbit on a uh, on a Soyuz. Uh, what do they call them? Um, a space flight participant um, on the Soyuz where he went up, uh, Haza al-Mansuri went up to the International Space Station on one Soyuz, spent about a week on the outpost and then came back down. So it's a it's a nice steady string of successes here and, and hopeful successes with this Mars mission for um, Alamal um, as it definitely um, uh, will do some pretty nice and, and, and groundbreaking things. Um, it's actually an international cooperation. Um, the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center is the technical owner and operator of the mission, but it was actually built in collaboration with the University of Colorado Boulder, Arizona State University, and the University of California Berkeley here in the United States. Um, and primarily what it's going to do, it's an orbiter, so there's no attachment on it that, that lands, but under a normal two Earth year or one Martian year mission, uh, it will look at all the seasonal weather patterns and cycles on Mars. Uh, this is an excellent uh, render here 
uh, from um, oh boy, Mark, help me out! Mark I can Crawford. only remember his form. Mark Mark Crawford. I could only remember his forum username all of a sudden. <laughs> um, uh, this is an excellent render by Mark of uh, Alamal riding on top of the second stage with the H two A rocket uh, during its. Uh, launch sequence and um, injection burn into a Mars transfer orbit. Um, but one of the things that this mission is primarily going to do is look at Mars, look at its seasonal weather cycles, um, particularly weather events in the lower atmosphere, such as dust storms and how weather varies across the, the regions of Mars. And in a lot of ways, the information that it's going to uh, bring back, not just to the United Arab Emirates, but to the world space community, will be some very useful information to feed into the overall goal of sending humans to Mars one day. So a very important little mission um, in terms, and I say little because the spacecraft by nature have to be kind of small um, to get them to Mars. Um, so, but 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 a very nice mission. In fact, Alamal weighs only 1300 kilograms. Um, so very, very small um mast payload when we think of you know interplanetary flights and 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 rovers as well but um it will be a, a very interesting mission and of course it is set to launch on the 14th from the tanagashima space center at 2051 and 27 seconds utc and the one thing i'd add about that is people don't usually watch these h2 launches or whatever these japanese launches i recommend you do this one not just for the payload not just for the mission but also because the launch site is one of the most beautiful launch sites in the world it really is a stunning, stunning launch center. So it's well worth watching it and being getting used to launches from Japan because that is one, if not the best, compared with Rocket Lab, probably. They've got one of the really, mm -hmm. a really nice launch site there, but Takashima is absolutely wonderful. Uh, it is, and it actually should be a sunrise launch. Um, Japan is about 14 hours ahead of the U.S. Eastern time, so that should translate into a local launch time of 6.51 and 27 seconds. So should be a gorgeous launch no matter what. It's the Mars, uh, Mars season, isn't it? We've got the season of Mars launches because we're in that transfer window now, so we're looking at, is it three launches to Mars in this period? That's how it the is current indeed, plan yeah. goes, yep. And we've got, yeah, this will be the first of the three. And then we've got the second one is from China. And I'm not going to get the name Tian right. So win one. <laughs> there you go, Christy, right on it. Uh, and that mission has three separate components. It's got an orbiter, a lander, and the lander's carrying a rover, right? So you actually got basically yeah. all three types of Mars missions rolled into one. Um, so that'll be exciting. And then the Perseverance rover from the United States. So three different countries with three different missions. Yeah, and I mean, and, and actually, I, I would argue four different countries. For oh, that's true, because you can include Japan. Partnership, yeah. Right, with, with the partnership. Um, it's not the first time Japan's launched something to Mars either. Um, they, they had previously launched their own mission um, um, out, outward to the Red Planet um, that didn't succeed. Um, and, and that's another thing to really talk about is getting to Mars is, is really, really hard. Um, the, the, the percentage is still like 54% of the overall missions we've attempted to send to Mars, whether they were orbiters, landers, or rovers, failed. Mm -hmm. um, it is it is incredibly difficult, um, incredibly difficult to do, um, and and no one has a perfect success record for for Mars. the The only agency that comes close actually is NASA, um, mm -hmm. and and that's when you consider the rovers. Every rover NASA's attempted to land has successfully landed, but but they've had their own problems, um, from faulty software to things that didn't work to um, forgetting to change back from imperial to metric i, I was gonna bring it up um, if you didn't <laughs> yep it's <laughs> still one of the more interesting fails but but you know we've, we've also seen great success in in, in first time entrance um to this field um earlier uh, this decade or in, in the 2010s um india launched the mars orbiter or mom mission uh their very first attempt at getting to mars and it worked and and was very successful and if you look at alamal and what they've really chosen they're on a they're on a launcher that has a good history that has a great track record um and you know the technology and and how it was built was done in a lot of collaboration with universities here in the united states so this mission has a, a very good chance of succeeding even though it's the first one from for the united arab emirates of this kind 
Absolutely. And we've got a question here in Jay that I want to bring up because he wants to know if we'll be live streaming that launch. And the answer is yes, because that is not the only launch happening within that like 10 minute span. The window yeah. for the next Falcon 9 yeah. launch from Florida opens nine minutes after the Mars mission is supposed to lift off. So NASA Spaceflight will be planning to bring you a dual sh one stream, two launches, um, one going to Mars and one going to geostationary orbit. We'll talk about the SpaceX mission later. Um, but yeah, we yes. will be planning to live stream this mission and it should be an exciting day for space so uh yeah um so i think we're gonna move on to another segment we're looking forward to that first of many mars missions this year uh but next up we're gonna talk about something a little more closer to home down in low earth orbit the boeing starliner spacecraft nasa recently completed their investigation into its first orbital test flight and we're going to talk a little bit more about how that's going to move forward and i believe that is chris g so take it away yeah, so this was um, th this really completed the the overall investigation, both uh, from the independent review board team as well as NASA. So so there's there's one thing to sort of break down and and, and separate here um, is that the independent review board team was different from the NASA internal investigation, and the results that got reported this week um, kind of made it sound like the eighty recommendations. Um, for, for how to proceed forward with Starliner, many of which Boeing is already working on. It, it, it kind of made it sound like those recommendations were coming from a different one and that they were 80 new recommendations. So just so everyone's clear and, and sort of on the same page, back in February, when Boeing themselves updated us on it, they said there were about 63 recommendations that had been identified so far by the independent review team. And those roughly 63 recommendations corresponded to the mission lapse timer issue and the other software issue with the separation of the service module and potential reconnect with the crew module. Um, at the time, very crucially in that February update, the team had not yet completed their investigation into the comm issue, the communications issue. So the reason we jumped from 63 recommendations to 80 is because those, the gap there that gets us to 63 to 80 were because of the comm system. Um, and the completion of that portion of the investigation from the independent review board team. Now, NASA also had their own internal investigation that they did because they clearly missed things too. And um, what was really refreshing, and I know Thomas, you listened into it live as it was happening. I, I was at the SpaceX pad trying to set remotes for um, Starlink earlier this week, but I did go back and listen to it. And one of the things that struck me um, what was how very different and how to me much more professional the tone was um from the previous updates we've gotten where kathy leaders as the new head of human spaceflight for nasa and steve stitch the new program manager for commercial crew both very instantly took um you know took responsibility for the failures and and really didn't mince words when they admitted that they as NASA missed things, that they as NASA got complacent and that they, and, and this was an admission I didn't really think was coming, but I was happy to hear in a lot of ways because it does show how um, how much they really looked at, at their own culture within NASA for this one is the admission that, um, hey, we, we had a double standard in terms of how much attention we gave to software development between the two providers. And they admitted that they didn't give Boeing as much oversight as in hindsight they should have because Boeing had the more familiar practice um, in software development. So overall, that was really good. Now, now the key takeaways here are that a lot of these, um, uh, a lot of these items, a lot of these action items, the 80 overall action items are already in work. Some of them were already complete actually, because some of them were, were small enough that they could be taken care of relatively quickly. So Boeing doesn't now have a list of 80 things that they need to go work on. Um, or, you know, Boeing and NASA have been working on all of those that they had already identified previously. So work has work has very steadily been progressing on this um, and, and with Starliner. Um, this is a photograph actually of the Starliner that flew OFT-1, the Calypso capsule, um, as named by Sonny Williams and who were supposed to be the first crew to fly this capsule. Um, uh, they will not um, now. They will be on on the on a on a different one, uh, most likely the one that flies OFT two. Um, so 
Boeing's been working on all of this. There is good progress being made, but the main thing that's going to drive the schedule at this point are the software changes and the process updates and all the things that have to be added to the software side of things. So for that reason, you know, NASA said they couldn't commit to a launch date at this time. They want to let the process play out um, and, and, and give Boeing the time that they need to fix the issue and not have them feel like there's pressure here. Um, to go quickly. This is a, a shot actually taken by NSF photographer Mike Deep of the launch of OFT1 uh, back in December of last year. A previous image that you saw of OFT1 on the pad was actually taken by NSF's Nate, Nate Barker um, during pre-launch uh, remote camera setup operations. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of work to do on, on, on Starliner and no one is really, no one is saying that, that there isn't, but the overall tone was that a lot was learned um and and that this will only improve the processes and the safety of the vehicles not just on starliner but across the board because nasa's and, and kathy leaders the new head of nasa's overall human spaceflight program was very clear that she intends to take all of these lessons learned and um and apply them across the entire human exploration mission operations directorate at nasa so um, you can really see how how seriously they took this in terms of applying it outward uh, so that these things don't happen again, even to things that are internal to NASA, like um, like Orion and and all and, and SLS's software and all of those things. So, you know, good things. And, and the key takeaway, too, with them being unable to commit to a launch date at this time, even a notional target for a second orbital flight test coming this year, you know, it is the same approach they took with SpaceX of not wanting to rush the Dragon Super Draco investigation. Let it take the time that it needs to, and let's make sure we we've, we've resolved everything. So, um, you know, we're not going to we might not see Starliner this year, but we might. Um, one thing that they're really going to have to look at once they have a firmer idea of when they might be targeting is the International Space Station's visiting vehicle schedule. Uh, when the new Cargo Dragon, um, which is a Crew Dragon modified into a cargo-only configuration, is there. Because if a Crew Dragon is there for the Crew-1 mission of Suichi Noguchi, Dan Glover, Mike Hopkins, and Shannon Walker later this year, and the Cargo-only Dragon is there, they're both using the two docking ports that are available to the commercial crew vehicles. So Starliner wouldn't have one to go to if a Cargo Dragon is there. So... <laughs> You know, a lot of things are going to have to be worked out. Um, and we also got a nice little nugget that um, Crew 2 might also be a SpaceX mission um, if CFT is not ready to fly um, and and hand off from Crew 1 at that time. So lots of things are still in the air, but good updates, good progress all around. And I'm sure people have questions, and I'd be happy, oh, absolutely. We'd be happy to got some I've more. got a yeah. queue <laughs> of some awesome questions about Starliner, so we can definitely go into that. Um, but yes, very exciting to get a lot of progress and updates on the Starliner program. I'll start with the very first one. Uh, any idea about the hardware items that were included in the 80 recommendations? Um, off the top of my head, and we can go back to the article to get more specifics, but I remember there was at least one bit of hardware. They're actually adding a filter to its uh, Starliner's radio receiver because they want to reduce the interference when it's communicating with the Tedris network, which was one of the three major anomalies that OFT encountered in orbit. Uh, so I know that's one piece of hardware. And, they, and like Chris said, they have actually already installed and tested that filter successfully. So that's done, ticked off the list. Um, but there probably are a couple other that involve hardware. And um, uh, Chris, do you remember off the top of your head if there's others? Um, no, the only hardware one I remembered off the top of my head was the was the filter. And and I think it not only had to do with like reducing interference from Tedris, but also limiting the number of communication channels and frequencies yes. that Starliner can receive. Um, right. Because I uh, it sounded to me like what they found with that communication issue was that so many things were communicating in 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 that range band that it just kind of freaked starliner out right. uh, like it was receiving too many things at one time and and things that it didn't need to receive from exactly. Tetris when it when it linked to it uh, that's what it sounded like so this filter should take care of that yeah most of the recommendations were within the software regime where they have to re, uh, mm -hmm. reprogram and recertify some things and the other 
part of like, like most recommendations was uh, testing and reviews, making sure that everything is tested thoroughly on the ground before launch. So those are the main areas. There were a couple hardware things. The filter is the one I can think of. Um, but yeah, mo mostly software and testing procedures. Yeah. Because uh, and, and uh, because one thing I do want to point out about the hardware, but I also want to point out that the, what's on your screen right now, Nicole, Chris, and um, Mike, they we need to put faces to why this is why this was taken so seriously and why yes, it's frustrating that we might not know a target launch date, but those three people need to come home to their wives and children and husbands. So absolutely, that's why we do this. We've got a question that actually came up in the press briefing, so we can talk about it. Uh, Jonathan wants to know if NASA will shift more of the missions to SpaceX because of Starliner's delays and issues. What are you guys' thoughts on that? So I think in terms of the overall distribution, um, no. Um, and, and, and the reason I say no to that, and I think the, the answer is actually a categorical no, is because beyond Crew-1, there are no assignments. Um, we know Crew-1 will be on Dragon, um, and it will launch sometime no earlier than September based on an uh, based on an August comeback date for Demo-2. We know the crew, the four people that are going up on that. Um, but beyond that, NASA is kind of leaving the option open right now because if OFT-2 can fly this year, if it is ready in time, um, the same software on OFT-2 will be the software load on the crew flight test so if everything goes perfectly with oft2 just like everything went perfectly on demo one for dragon right and and when that mission landed we had nasa officials immediately saying i don't see any reason why a crew test flight can't be a couple of months down the road right right same thing is setting up now for starliner so it is still technically although technically maybe right. not realistically possible at this point for OFT2 to fly while the Dragon Crew-1 is at the station, and then for CFT, the crew flight test, to be the one that goes up in the March-April timeframe to rotate with Crew-1. Um, that is still a possibility, but what is also a possibility is that that wouldn't work out, so then the rotation in March of 2021 has to be a Crew Dragon again, and SpaceX is preparing a Crew Dragon for that timeline and can meet that timeline if they need to. Um, and it's possible that it would be a direct dragon to dragon handover between crew one and crew two, which actually reinforces the whole reason and a big point that Kathy Leaders was trying to make this week of dissimilar redundancy. Dragon is here. Dragon can do these direct handovers while Starliner is getting up and running just the same way that if Dragon were to ever have an issue, Starliner could do these direct handovers as well. So we're already seeing that built-in redundancy helping us out here. I would also note that the first time dissimilar redundancy was mentioned was by SNC when they were talking about Dream Chaser. So mm -hmm. there's some irony yep. there with the down yeah. select to CCTP cat, which was where Dream Chaser was denied further funding. And it was given yeah. the bulk of the funding was given to Boeing and the rest was given to SpaceX. And we've seen the result of it. I will obviously note that when we do talk about Boeing, we'll talk about Starliner and the negatives of what's happened with their test. Chris has already pointed out the positives, which will be beneficial for the crew launches, but also the fact that we've got to remember there's people working on this program, putting their blood and sweat into it. And they are working as hard as possibly can. This is not easy. This is space flight. It's never easy. They're putting their blood and soil into it, and they're basically saying, you know, they're doing the best they can. We've got to respect that. We've got to understand that. So when we're quick to say on chat rooms or whatever, you know, oh, Boeing, it's Boeing again. We've got to remember there's people behind this. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'll reiterate a point that Chris made earlier because it's so good to see the results of this investigation into Starliner's first flight were shared across every human spaceflight program within NASA. That means they were shared with SpaceX for Crew Dragon, to Boeing and Lockheed Martin for SLS and Orion, to the human landing system development. All of those programs will benefit off of every lesson learned from Starliner. This is a team effort across many different companies and teams, and they want to give every program the best chance of success based on everything they learned. So it really is, you know, it's not all about competition. There's a bit of that, but it, it's overall, it's a team effort to accomplish all of NASA's goals with human spaceflight. And this is a great step forward. Um, before and the I, next question. I, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. 
Oh, I was just going to add really quickly that I think another element of this that that does get looked over because, you know, Boeing space is different from Boeing. Airplanes, like in terms of the sure. hierarchical structure and everything of the company, right? But these lessons learned from Starliner are going to be applicable to other Boeing products as well, right? So like it's it's going to have some kind of a positive impact on the airplane side of Boeing, on the defense contracting side of Boeing, on, on the X-37B, which gets overlooked because we forget that it's a Boeing vehicle as well a, a lot of times. But um, it, it, it's not just the human element that's going to benefit. It's it's also, you know, our everyday travel and the Boeing technology that we, that we do rely on every day as well will benefit from this. Absolutely. And before that next question, which is relevant, so I'll bring it up. But uh, we did have a super chat from Future Martian, Future Martian 97. So every thank time. Yeah, he's here every stream and we every greatly stream. appreciate yeah. it. Thank you for the super chats. Those super chats and the channel memberships is what allows us to keep doing these shows and bring you live coverage of events and things. So we appreciate your support. Uh, but a question relating to sort of the overall Boeing structure, which may or may not have had a contributing factor. Uh, Ron Smith wants to know if there was an investigation into NASA's processes or was it limited only to Boeing? And the answer is there are totally things that NASA is going to change and improve on in the wake of this test flight. Um, in fact, uh, Steve Stitch uh, made a very clear point that NASA has to assume a little bit of responsibility for approving the testing regime that it resulted with this test flight not going completely to plan. That's a big part mm -hmm. of this. Um, I believe he said, I'm, I'm going to forget the direct quote. It was in, It's in this article that I'm seeing on my screen, but it's probably farther down. He made a point about the, a, la a lack of oversight. That's the word he used. Um, because mm -hmm. they were looking at the two commercial crew providers and especially related to software, which was one of the main points uh, for how this test flight failed. Um, they, they looked at SpaceX software development thing and they thought that that was a uh, less familiar um, method for developing software. It was something that NASA wasn't quite as comfortable with. So they allocated more resources to overview that process at SpaceX, which evidently worked well because the software functioned flawlessly on the Kerr Dragon missions. However, that means there were slightly less resources over at Boeing. So Steve Stitch said that the, that may have been a contributing factor and NASA is going to make sure that they allocate resources uh, su sufficiently uh, to make sure that that sort of lack of oversight doesn't lead to problems down the road. So that was totally part of this uh, review, uh, looking at not just Boeing, but NASA itself. Um, and then we got another question about the recent parachute test. Um, DDVU wants to know if the recent parachute test was a result of any of these findings. I don't believe it was. I think that was going to happen regardless, right? Yeah, that is correct. They, they were the final round of qualification testing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that was not related to the OFT investigation. It happened kind of a lin uh, within the same time frame, but not as a result of any investigation. I don't think there were any parachutes on the OFT mission, so nothing like that to worry about. Well, there were parachutes on OFT because it, it, <laughs> no, it, no, it sorry, landed. No, par no, par um. <laughs> no parachute issues. I think, uh, I think yes, that's what no I said. Maybe no, no. Yeah, no parachute yeah. issues. There were no, absolutely, sorry, there were perfectly functioning parachutes. I just pictured the Starliner bouncing on its airbag for the next three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Doing like a spirit and opportunity drop. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Moving right along to other American crew vehicles, we're going to go about a decade, almost a decade in the past. Oh, next year is the big yeah. anniversary, but we've got an anniversary that happened this week in spaceflight, the final flight of the space shuttle program, STS-135, and we've got our two favorite shuttle huggers to talk about it. Chris <laughs> Chris B., take it away. Well, I'll start with the background. The background of STS-135 is fascinating in itself because it was all related to Columbia. Columbia ended the shuttle program effectively. When they said they were going to do the final shuttle launches, they said it was the final round of shuttle launches. It was all about finishing off the ISS. And it all had to be done within certain boundaries. Any of those missions that had failed before the end of the shuttle program, it would have killed the shuttle program full stop. That was the last failure they could have. It was all or nothing for the next, la next launches. And the plan was to have quite a lot of launches at start. But of course problems were, were endured and they had to make so many technical changes for safety reasons that they only had a set amount of launches and they were going to end on STS-132. Now, of course, by the time they got to, close to STS-132, they'd realised that the backup, the can transition, which was Orion and Ares 1 and some commercial cargo by then, were not going to be ready on time. 
and they could not really get away with supplying the ISS fully on just progress and, and those resupply launches. So they had to think, what do we do now to make sure the ISS is fully stocked to cope with the gap and to have enough stock, enough reserves to keep a presence, a continued presence on the ISS, which they've successfully achieved. And that was to add two more missions, STS-133, STS-134. Those two missions, of course, had their own uh, unique payloads, such as AMS-2 on, on STS-134, which is Endeavour's flight. But they needed a reserve flight as well, because the, the last shuttle missions all had what was called launch on need. Now, launch on need was another shuttle ready to go in case the shuttle I was launching had a problem. If the shuttle launching had a problem, they would dock at the ISS, they would wait at the ISS for several months, wait for the next shuttle mission, and the next shuttle mission would pick them up and bring them back down again. That was what launch on need was. Of course, STS-134 needed a launch on need mission, which was STS-335, STS they called it. That was the continued support registration for it. Then in 2010, Charlie Bolden, the administrator of NASA, said, we need to have another flight. We're not going to have enough stock on the ISS to survive this gap to commercial crew. So they changed STS-335 into STS-135, becoming the final shuttle mission, which was with Atlantis. It was no launcher need support. They could have converted Discovery around and used her because she was flight record. They called it the vehicle on record, they called Discovery. They didn't take any of their parts out. They left her in a stored, mothballed condition. So if a problem with SCS-135 had happened, Discovery would have come to the rescue. But that was, in ultimately, the final mission. And that was the final mission nine years ago. Today, Atlantis was docked at the ISS, where Dragon Endeavour is, is actually docked right now. The same port, albeit with the... Um, the um, ID, IDA, the International Docking Adapter, which is the little extension part which the Dragon docks to. But that was exactly nine years ago now this all happened, and it doesn't seem that long ago. It's, it still surprises me when people talk about Shuttle. It feels both like a decade ago, but also it yeah. feels quite relevant still, because we still see reminders of the Shuttle program in pictures, in documentation, and in news articles, even in movies. They're still using Shuttles in some movies, because they're just not moved on from that transition where they moved to different vehicles what was that weird movie where it was like geo disaster or something like Geostorm. that like, like, geo storm yes yep. there are like a hundred shuttles on a launch pad i it, remember it, seeing it was, that on the yeah. for the first time and the, the, the show the gerald gerald Brooke butler was the main actor they showed yeah. him he had a home on cape canaveral i think it was merritt island where he was based his home and he could look across to cape canaveral and he could see hundreds of launch pads, all with shuttles on them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking. Now, now, hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, you know it, it, it's fascinating going back and, and and reliving some of these things about how we how how we did it and, and the safety requirements because I I totally remember I I totally did not remember until you started saying it that the original plan they were trying to put together was we just won't mothball discovery so that if atlantis yeah. has a problem we could maybe have discovery and then i remember the external tank and booster folks coming in and going that's great where is there an external tank where is there a set of solid rocket boosters and then they kind of had to go oh right we're using the last set of those for atlantis and 135 because i remember yeah. them making a big point that if atlantis had to do a tal abort or uh, an rtls abort there that was it like, the, ex the program the would have ended with a Taller and RTLS, yeah. you know. On the external tank front alone, there was drama sounding that because had Hurricane Katrina had hit the Mashoud assembly facility and actually really mm -hmm. caused quite a lot of problems with the, their production facility. And I've got to bring up these little stories. The, the, the manager of Mashoud at the time was a, a lady called Wanda Sugar. And she was yeah. a top-ranking Lockheed Martin manager the top person at math, and she worked 18 hours a day on the shop floor with the rest of her workforce, despite the fact that half of her workforce were out homeless now because they all lived in Sidel, which is across from New Orleans, yeah. which got devastated by Katrina. They all came in. Not one person didn't come in. They all came in yeah. to make sure they had enough external tanks to finish the program. And that stuck yeah. with me for ages because she was such a great manager, and I think she's moved up in the world since. Um, throughout the um, space industry um, ladder. But some of these stories, you hear about the dedication people put in to these vehicles, and it doesn't get reported too much. I reported it, thankfully. Yeah. But um, <laughs> it, it's just incredible dedication. If you think about STS-134, 
But before, that flew with ET-122, which was a repaired tank from Katrina, and it looked a mess. It had patches all over it. It, it didn't look right at all, but it had no problems. It was the cleanest tank in the shuttle history program for TPS deliberate, deliberation. So nothing came yeah. off that tank. So it just goes to show they know what they're talking about. I mean, and, and, and what, what I was absolutely amazing, because I, I totally remember the, the whole which mission is going to use the tank because the repaired tank was originally going to be Atlantis's for 135. Yep. And then they got nervous about that because it was a repaired tank. And they said, well we'd rather put that on the one with a dedicated launch on need flight. So they gave that tank to Endeavor and then Atlantis got Endeavors. Yeah. Um, and, and, but, but yeah, it was, it was the cleanest tank from a foam liberation standpoint. And I, and, and there was just one little ice ball that came off and slammed into Endeavors underside, but one of those like underwhelming hits where it was made a big deal on orbit. They did the final, ins they did a dedicated inspection of it. And the gouge is still there on Endeavor when you walk underneath yeah. the the orbiter at the California Science Center. And, you know, I pointed it out to Kristen and even her response was, that's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, but yeah, the thing is, that they took it. it so seriously that anything wrong, they went deep dive into it. They checked everything. They were going to take no chances after Columbia. No chances yeah. at all. But yeah, you were talking about the tanks. It's funny because the last final few tanks had problems with the stringers. Which I don't yeah. think we've got a picture there, Thomas. We can bring it up. Our, the producers can bring it up, Michael, where it shows an external tank. Because there's a part, the middle part, the inter tank, which is called, called stringers. And those stringers were popping during cryo loading. Mm. And they couldn't work out why it was. And they did so many tanking tests on these external tanks to get it right. Because if one of those stringers had popped during flight, it'd have been it such have a big zippered. impact on the wing. So it'd have been really serious. So uh, that's another think... thing they, they fixed on the fly. Yeah at KSC, mm -hmm. and they kept on repairing them in the VAB. They shipped them from the chute, knowing they had a problem, and in the VAB, they had this special curtain put around the external tank, which is like an environmentally safe pl uh, place to work on it, and they stripped off all the foam. They put uh, specially reinforced stringers in, and they put the foam back on. So technically, the VAB, for a, a few years, became an external tank production facility, because they were literally putting foam on tank inside there. It's just amazing it, the, the the stories that come up because I didn't remember that until just now when I saw a picture earlier of uh, the external tank. It's just there's so many shuttle stories that makes you realise that although it's sad the programs ended because they were beautiful vehicles and they were very capable vehicles, it's also quite a bit of a sigh of relief because there were so many problems with them that yeah. it was only a matter of time before the one went wrong. And when they go wrong, oh. they go wrong big time. So it's not yeah. good. And and uh, and I think too, like like one of the one of the things that this anniversary this year, it it hasn't felt like anniversaries in the past year because the gap is finally over. It's yeah. it's no it's no longer sad because we gave it up, because we gave up the ability to launch people, which is essentially what we were doing. We we were saying that's it. We're yeah. too afraid of this right now, so we're just gonna go away from it. And however long the gap is, that's fine because the thing that's hard to remember now is that when Atlantis landed, that previous photo of the crew in front of Atlantis with then administrator Charlie Bolden, there was no SLS rocket. We had Orion, but nothing to launch it on. Yeah. Uh, there, there was no Crew Dragon contract. There was no Starliner contract. There were no commercial crew go build these vehicle contracts. We literally gave it up. And for the first time this anniversary passed this year without a, you know, like, yeah, yeah. Come well, on, the, like, the and, thing, and it's different. Yeah. The, the thing to mention, but I'll just quickly mention this external tank. People are talking about the stringers. If you look at the pipe, which is a locked tank, uh, look at the pipe, look where it goes to the middle of the tank, and it's a different kind of shade during the um, the top, um, let's say the top 60%, 70% of the tank. That's the stringers. One of those things could have popped off. That was the problem they had. So that was why it was so serious and why they had to fix it. But yeah, we're talking and... about crew. Now, the interesting thing about SCS-135 is the commander was Christopher Ferguson, and he mm -hmm. is going to be the command, he's going to be the first person to fly on Starliner in the same way as Doug Hurley, who also flew on that mission, SCS-135, flew on Dragon Endeavour, and has become the person to capture the flag. We made a big deal about that on Twitter and on the yes. on news articles because that flag flew, the US flag flew on SCS-1, it flew on SCS-135, and on SCS-135, both Chris Ferguson and Doug Hurley placed it on the door, on the Node 2 door, ready for it to be captured. That's what they call it, capture the flag. 
by the first commercial astronauts to fly, commercial crew astronauts to fly to the ISS. And Doug Hurley will have that honour to bring it back to Earth again. And that's going to go to the moon on next yep. uh, on an Artemis mission. So yep. that flag has and, got a history. <laughs> and what I absolutely love about it is when they left that flag, they had they had no idea that they would be on the first crew flights of the no, vehicles. No, no idea. They, they right. thought it'd probably yeah. be an Orion because the, the, yeah. the, the, the Orion was originally going to be a low Earth orbit vehicle to go to ASS. And that was going to be first launched in 2013, would you believe? Orion's <laughs> and, first launch and, was manifest 2013. And this is what always blows my mind, is it was a little tiny thing that in the long run turned out to be nothing. But when Ares 1, oh, when Ares 1 was canceled with the Constellation program, there were significant talks that went into, can we put Orion on an atlas and yeah, launch it on the yes, International yes. Space Station? Um, and then NASA and well, not NASA, Congress decided that that wouldn't look good if we're justifying SLS. So it actually ended up becoming a prohibition in the development yeah. cycle to they were, not they were get even Orion looking, developed quicker. They were even they looking were at looking. launching it from 39A because they yeah. showed pictures of diagrams <laughs> yeah. of, uh, of an Atlas Atlas 5 MLP being moved into the VAB. With a rod yeah. being stacked on top, and then moved out to 39A, which was crazy yeah. because 39A was literally a shuttle pad. Still, it, it literally had to be converted by SpaceX, which came years later. Yeah. So the, the desperation to look at Atlas V just showed there because they were, they were looking at all the options possible to get that Orion launch, and of course, it all changed anyway. Now, Michael, I'm being very mindful of time, but can you go back to the crew after landing photo, please? Because this, to me, ties we'll into cut the, the shuttle huggers off nicely. in a minute, but we can. Uh... <laughs> I, I, no, 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 no! I'm going to be a good shuttle hugger and, and do a good history thing here. Do a good history thing. So, so when that uh, image of Atlantis and the crew land uh, after landing um, is back up, the reason I wanted to bring this back um, actually is because uh, there's there's something else that Atlantis still holds the record for, but next week most likely will not. Um, Atlantis currently holds the record for shortest duration between two launches of an orbital class rocket. Uh, Atlantis holds that record at 54 days between uh, the first launch of Atlantis on STS-51J and the second launch on STS-61B in October and November of 1985. We do believe that the booster that Falcon 9 erected, uh, or the booster that SpaceX erected of Falcon 9 on Slick 40 today is booster 1058, which launched the Demo 2 mission of Bob and Doug back in May, and was now tasked with launching the Anasys 2 mission uh, no earlier than the 14th of July. If that occurs, SpaceX will take the record from Atlantis, and Falcon 9 will take the record from Atlantis at 46 days between two launches of an orbital class rocket. That's yeah. good to happen on the anniversary overlap of 135, I think. That's awesome. Will Atlantis still have the record for quickest turnaround of a crew vehicle? Or was oh, there... yes. Yeah. Oh, I was yes. wondering if there was some random, like, <laughs> Gemini or Mercury capsule that got reflown or something. Uh, there think. was one capsule in the Gemini era that was reflown, but not. But not but that Atlantis fast. holds the record for a crew right. vehicle and a rocket. Yes. So Atlantis has got plenty of records to her name, and most of those aren't going anywhere anytime soon. So there we go. But we do have to uh, cut the mics of the shuttle huggers because we do have to move on. We're going to talk about uh, the past week of launches. Christy is going to talk about several orbital launches that happened this past week. Past this past week, Chris, take it away. <laughs> yeah we did have quite a few missions this this week um and oh first we begin with rocket lab um uh it's been wonderful to watch the team and especially peter beck um we start the process of working through uh this failure electron's 13th mission uh picks or it didn't happen um an ironic name after the fact um given that the first indication of something going wrong was the camera failing um on the second stage but um uh yeah Ro Ro rocket labs uh, 13th mission failed we were actually live on air for nsf live last week when it happened um uh the teams are tracking everything down according to peter back we we had some great um an actual good video message from him um and praising the teams and their dedication and their work and the payload customers as well that lost their payloads on this um at least one of them has said that they look forward to flying with rocket lab again and they have every confidence in them so uh not what we not what we wanted but um they'll be back and i and i would i would imagine they'll be back quickly um 
in this, but that was the first one. Uh, we then quickly moved on just a couple of hours later, actually after the Rocket Lab launch, to a uh, Shenzhen 2D launch from the Zhuquan Satellite Launch Center in China. Um, this was a mission that uh, took the uh, Xi'an 6 um, and co-passengers uh, rideshare mission up into orbit. Um, uh, Xi'an 6 is in this uh, space environment detection uh, satellite and associated technologies, but eh, not a lot is super duper known about it, but uh, that was one. Uh, and then the next one was an absolute shock to everyone when Israel announced an hour and a half after the fact that they had launched a rocket, um, that they had launched their um, uh, Shavit 2 rocket for the, oh, oh man, the oh, OFAC, OFAC 16? Yep. I, I'm so Yep. Okay, cool. Um, 16 satellite into low Earth orbit. This was notable for a couple of reasons. One, um, the only trajectory that Israel has to launch anything in that region, if they don't wish it to be shot down, um, is westward into a retrograde orbit out over the Mediterranean Sea. So um, this was a, a rare retrograde launch and a true Western retrograde launch. Um, uh, so that was pretty notable. Also kind of notable is they gave absolutely no warning. There were no airspace closures. There were no notice to airmen. There were no notice to mariners. There was absolutely nothing that this thing was firing. And uh, no one said that was a bad thing, but um, it's worth pointing out, um, and for objectivity, that a couple of nations over, Iran, has made a few launch attempts recently, and they've given ample warning uh, that they were going to do it and have been widely condemned by the international community. But Israel shot something off into space with no warning to anyone, and it all just kind of slid under the radar. So that was a very interesting one, and again, one no one expected. Uh, we then had the Shenzhen uh, 3D um, launching from China again with the AppStar 6D telecommunication satellite, major high throughput communication satellite going up there from the China Great Wall Industry Corporation. Uh, and that was a successful launch from the Shenzhen Satellite Launch Center in China. And then rounding out the week um, for launches was the maiden voyage of the Kuizhou 11 uh, rocket. This is an all solid rocket vehicle that was making its debut mission. Um, and unfortunately it failed later into the mission. The only thing that we got from China um, was that um, China confirmed a failure and loss of the mission quote late stage, um, but no specifics were immediately forthcoming. Um, and we probably won't get a lot of answers from this, but um, this is part of the uh, growing rapid launch capability industry within China. Um, and the Kuizhou uh, series of rockets are actually owned by Xspace, um, uh, which is as close to a private company as you can get um, in China. So. Uh, good progress. And then, of course, um, we were supposed to this morning have a Starlink launch, but that dovetails nicely into Chris's section. Absolutely. We're going to go over to Chris Bergen, who's going to uh, preview the upcoming launches for the next week. Chris, go ahead. Yeah, technically, the next Starlink mission is the next launch, which is basically we're looking at now, um, hopefully in a few days' time. But it's it's looking quite dodgy because we're watching through um, the tracking of the fleet, the SpaceX fleet, that the chances are... They're repositioning their drone ships to allow for the next SpaceX launch, which is the third one on the list, the Anasurus 2 launch, to launch next, which would then put Starlink behind it. Now, if we take into account that Starlink is a SpaceX mission, their internal mission, they have that right to juggle around the manifest for a primary payload. But there is some, there are some Black Widow, uh, Black Eyes launching on this Starlink mission. So that would be interesting to see how that all plays in. They are secondary passengers, so I don't think they can play too much of a big role as compared to an Aristotle 2. So technically, we're thinking Starlink will go behind the next uh, SpaceX launch. Now, we do know what's coming up. JAXA H2A, which is the 202 version, that's launching the LML mission to Mars, which we spoke about at the start of the show. And that's going from Takashima. You'll thank me later if you watch that because of the launch site. It's beautiful. I've mentioned that too before. Uh, north of Grumman, they're um, launching their Minotaur 4, which is a rare Minotaur launch. Really a very basic looking <laughs> vehicle. It's it's what you think a rocket should look like. It's basically like a missile. It's going to launch from Wallops. It's launching the NRL 129 mission, which is obviously National Defense. Um, and that's on July the 15th at 1 o'clock UTC, which is the morning year Eastern time. Launch from Pad 0B, Wallops, Virginia, which is where all the um, Norfolk Grumman 
Minotaur and Antares launches all take off from. And then we're going on to SpaceX Falcon 9, which is Antares 2, which is on July 14th currently. The window opens at 9 o'clock UTC, which is in the afternoon, uh, local time from SLC-40, Cape Canaveral Air Force Space Station in Florida. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the two Starlink missions where they'll all fit in with each other because we think Starlink will go behind that next Falcon 9 mission. Absolutely. A busy two days coming up this week and potentially that Starlink mission whenever they get that ready to go. Uh, but thank you, Chris. And now we're going to go to probably the most popular segment on NASA Space Flight Live, the very latest from SpaceX Boca Chica. Mary has been out there every day capturing photos and video. We've got a lot of new developments. Uh, who wants to start off with just what's going on this week down there? I'll do a quick round. I can tell you. Oh, yeah, right, go. I, was, I, was, I see. Where, no, I was going to say, you, there's some you do the round because I know what I mean. <laughs> Well, what we're looking at right now is Starship SM5. That is the latest Starship, one in a row of Starships, and there's more to come. So that's how they work in Boca Chica. They've got a, a literally a, a lining up the Starships ready for testing. We know SM4 did nothing wrong by her nature. It was the uh, ground support equipment which failed for her. So that's why they're quite confident SM5, which is the same manufacturing techniques, the same steel 301L. Uh, as Starship SM4 should get through these um, cryo testing. It's already done the cryo testing itself. Next is a static fire test, and that'll be coming next week. You can see there, there are, first of all, there's a mass simulator which is going on top, a little hat for a Starship, which is basically, we think, the mass simulator for the nurse current, so it gets a good idea of the, the dynamics when they, do lot, when they do fire up this rocket, and of course, that'll be there for the hop as well. So you've got the same kind of... Um, Full mass you'd expect with a Starship with a fair and a nurse cone on top. So they're going to use an SN27 Raptor, which will be doing the static fire test. That'll be next week. Hopefully there'll be one or two static fire tests. They'll pass through saying it's good to go and they'll let a hop 150 metres. So that will be coming up in a very close order. You can't expect the 150 metre hop potentially in two weeks. I don't know. I'm probably pushing it a little bit there because they always have challenges. Providing SN5 gets through the static fire tests, I don't see any reason why not, because they've they've tested everything so far to the point they know what Starship can do. They know the failing points, which is the cryoproofing. They know the failure points when they do the GSC wrong, when they're trying to do a fast uh, detanking. Uh, de so they know those things now. They've got them out of the way. Providing these next static fire or two, we don't have to be more than one static fire. If they go successfully next week, the hop could be in the week after. And then we'll see this fly 150 meters. So that's what I'm looking forward to while we're still in the SM5 videos. Chris, do you have anything to tell yeah. about SM5? Yeah, no, I I, I, I think that's right. Um, I, I mean, I, I would see no impediment to hopping in a couple of weeks um, if, if provided everything goes goes well. Um, it was it was amazing to me how many people, I just have to say this because it was amazing to me how many people loved the video of that mass simulator going on top of it. <laughs> um, that just, I mean, the uh, the views were just amazing on that one and it was a really cool operation um yeah yeah <laughs> no Ma mary so... knows mary knows what to look for that's the thing about mary she films what she knows people want to see that's the great thing about her she's got yeah. life for it. it you could you could send anybody out there let's pretend we're millionaires let's go and buy out a, a massive van we'll send everyone down there to take pictures and photos and videos it's not going to work because you've got to be able to know what you're looking for. You've got to know what's happening. You've got yeah. to be there for the events. You've got to know the processes. You've got to know the SpaceXs to be able to trust you to be able there to film you for a start. You can't just pop down Which... there, point a camera in someone's face and expect right. them to think, oh, hang on a minute. Is this person going to block my face out or not? They know Mary will. And that's a big thing. Right. You wouldn't believe that's a big thing. So that's another the thing. Private, I'd like the to privacy mention, but... element of the workforce is, I think, something that does get overlooked because it is on a public area, right? Yeah. And you can literally just walk right up and take photos. I mean, it is amazing the access that we still have um, to, to this area, owing a lot because it's a public beach. But, um, but yeah, um, I, I put to your point about like Mary, you know, what knowing what people want to look for, having that relationship with people. I mean, case in point for me was the dog. <laughs> when we finally got to see Zeus yeah. this week. Uh, that is all I was waiting for all week, if I'm being honest. I wanted to see Zeus, and we finally saw him. It's Mr. Zeus. But before we get to Zeus's um, uh, video, um, uh, we have the, the high bay, um, because we did, we did see um, the new high bay progress for super heavy and and what were we calling the crane um bluezilla bluezilla, bluezilla yeah. yeah bluezilla yes. is a huge bluezilla, crane. yeah yeah 
Yeah. Now that that's an yeah, interesting one he... because that's going to be building the super heavy high bay, which is going to be bigger than. That's why we now know they're calling that one you can see right now, which has been built, which has been built with SN6 inside. We know we that's why they're calling it the mid bay. We thought why do they call it mid bay? That makes sense. It's a high bay. It's not because the high bay is coming. That's going to be even bigger. So that's right. why they're doing it. 81 meters tall, I think they were saying, wasn't it? Should it be a high bay and higher bay? Yeah. <laughs> Super high bay. Super high bay. There you go. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> I like that. Super high bay. Yeah. But I mean, like this really underscored to me too when, when we saw the walls starting to go up and, and, and we saw the, the high bay for, for super heavy um starting to come together this really reinforced for me what i have been saying for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks which is do not panic that we haven't seen anything on the super heavy booster yet because you are seeing it because the commonality between the starship design and the super heavy design and the the engines and the metal and the welding and, and the tanking and, and the fueling and everything uh, you know basically in oversimplified terms, they just now have to build a super heavy, strap some more Raptors to it, and get some good testing in it because you're doing a lot of the groundwork on the Starship element itself. And I think this was a very good and in some ways needed visual um, of just how much progress is actually happening down there um, for, for the future and how quickly this could go once they hit their cadence with Starship testing. Yeah, because they've got the vehicles. The people keep asking me, well, oh, that's good. They've got the vehicles, but they've only got so many Raptors. They're only on SN27 have been testing these Raptors for ages, haven't they? Well, if you're a, a very obvious plug here, but if you're a member of this channel and you're Red Team Ohio, I put a photograph in the membership area, which will tell you all you need to know about how far along they are with Raptor. Because you'll see on that picture, without giving it too much away, there's a surprise there. And that just shows that they are pumping out Raptors like you would not believe. And that will get them into a position where if they get a successful 150 meter hop, if they get a successful 20 kilometer hop, which we think would be at SN8 or SN9, um, if they get that far and they're ready to start pumping up these launches, these test launches, they will have the Raptors ready. So that'll be something to look out for. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to the SN5 campaign because we're into the point where we're again looking to get the Starship program farther than it's ever gotten before. We've gotten to Starship Static Fire. We have not done Starship Hop. We've done the Star Hopper Hop, but not a full scale Starship. So we're getting to the point where we're ready to go into unproven territory, and that's always exciting. So I can't wait to see that. That's sad to see the um, the test tank there just on its side. Yeah. <laughs> And there we've got we've got SM5 rolling to the launch pad with a big yellow crane, which is now being demoted to just a, a yellow crane after Bluezilla arrived. Right, yeah, it's not big in comparison <laughs> anymore, right? Yeah, it's no longer the big crane. But this this is just a fascinating thing. And I'm also also intrigued by how SN um sorry, not SN, the super heavies will fly will um, mm. be driven down here on the roll lifts. I, I can't imagine they'll be rolling like this. Yeah, we're just too tall. I think they'll have to go horizontal, but they've still got that bend in the road, so it'd be quite fascinating to see how wide a turn they take just mm. to get into this well, part. Do, do, do you think we might... Uh, I mean, because those things can keep it pretty level. I mean, I mean, that's basically just... that They, they basically makeshifted a crawler transporter yeah. for them out there. I mean, may, may, maybe, maybe the trick is it just gets bolted down for the move. Well, it's, um, it's, it's going to be how much taller than this will uh, I, know, I, I know, I know, I know, I know, but I know, I, 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 <laughs> I mean, get it. Ha- I let, get let, it. Fa- <laughs> they will I have to wait. bolt it down. Let's, there's no question about it. Yeah. Gonna, be on a test stand like SM5 is there. That is bolted onto the test stand, but uh, you know, I think Elon might need to spill the beans a little bit on that. I think they might go horizontal with it because then just erect it at the launch site because it's going to be twice as tall as this at least. So it's going to be one heck of a thing. And it's going to go further really down the road. Will. It's going to come further down this road to the super heavy site as well. It's got a further trip to make. But um, yeah. we're getting ahead of ourselves because we want to see Starship work first. We've got to get all these sure. tests out yeah. of the way. We want to see yeah. that belly flop landing. That belly flop return with the drag and drop and basically just hope for the best. That landing for Starship is going to be something surreal to watch. Everybody who's watching it who isn't initiated with what Starship does are going to think this thing is failing badly. And it's not. It's it's designed to come down, belly flop, right. and it's designed to do a little big swing of its aft and come back down, land on its legs. So it'd be fascinating to see that. That will be amazing it to really see. Will. 
<laughs> uh, we've got a couple of uh, questions and super chats to get through. We're going to go dive into this. Uh, Keith Rowley is a new member for the channel. So thank you for your support. We appreciate it. And then we've got a question from Dougal. What SN number is beside SN6? Do you think we'll get an SN7.2 or an SN8 test tank? And thanks for your work. We greatly appreciate your support. What is beside SN6, guys? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a, a test tank. Possibly a test tank. The, the thing that's caught us out is the test tanks are normally not assembled in the mid bay. So we're looking at where we are. Let's look at this picture for a start. SN6 on the left hand side. That is um, not a 304L tank. That is a test tank we're looking at right there. That is definitely test tank bulkheads. And the one on the right hand side of that mid bay picture, that is. Really, it could be one of two things. It could be the SN 7.1 or 2 or whatever they want to call it. I don't think they'll give it a full Starship name because for test tank, it could be that test tank. If not, it could be SN 8. Now, if SN 8 is a full Starship, it would be the first Starship of 3 or 4L. And we'll see it different. We'll see a difference. If they keep SN 6 in the, high, in the mid bay and they build and stack at SN 8, if that's what it is, in the mid bay, we'll soon find out. We'll see the differences of the steel. We think it'd be a lot shinier, a lot smoother, a lot more like the renders. And that will be the one to get aero surfaces, and that'll be the one that'll be flying 20 kilometers, providing SM5 passes its 150 meter hop test. So it's all caveats. It's mm -hmm. all caveats. We've got to see this progression. And they're doing it. They're doing a the progression. We're seeing all these vehicles go pop and whatever, but they're still progressing each time. They're still going further. The test tank survived. It survived its testing. It got through as far as to the point they had to destruct it. It was on purpose. They took it past the point they need to do. That was a good test. These are good tests for them to come. And then we've got to see how 304L as a full Starship performs. But that's what I think it is, to answer the question in a very long way. <laughs> I think it's one of two things. It's either a test tank, which we won't call a full SN8 or whatever, or it'll be a, a next Starship, the first Starship to be built, to built fully out of 304L. All right, we've got another new member, Nicholas. Welcome to the channel membership. We appreciate your support. And then Colin's got a super chat question. Thank you for your support. Given that Starship is made of thin steel that we often see flexing in the Texas wind, how will the Starship structure withstand the forces of the Raptor's thrust and also high from Belfast, Northern Ireland? So thoughts on thin stainless steel supporting lots of Raptor engines? Pressurization. That's yeah. how they get. That's what it is. It's pressurized. That's what makes it rigid. That makes it strong. So these, the the, the the big question is the welds, and they've got the welds sorted now. They know that they've changed the settings. They've got a robotic welder. They've got everything much more um, finite and and secured in the way they construct these starships. It is thin steel, but once it's pressurized, it's a rigid structure. So it'll say so it'll, it, that that's what they're designed for. There is there is no but what if question because this is spacex they're rocket engineers they know what they're doing we're just confirming that we know that it's fine as it is even though you see these rings being walked in on the, on the forklifts and the wobbling about they do look very thin the wobbling about they look extremely fragile and not they're, they're quite strong especially when they're welded and when they're pressurized most importantly when they're pressurized yeah i i, I would equate it to like if you get a two liter bottle of soda and like you and, and you just pick it up off the shelf and you can like press in the sides of that really, really thin plastic, but then if you shake it really vigorously and you get, you know, all yeah. the carbonation released in there and it pressurizes it, you suddenly can't push in on it. Same, same basic idea with Starship. There you go. All right, let's talk SN5 schedule. Dougal wants to know if we have any speculation on when the SN5 static fire could occur. Next week. Probably mid next week, I'd think, providing there's no hiccups as far as the pad preparations go, because we know they've delayed it before a few days recently. So we know they've been having some challenges getting everything ready, but that's fine. It's only a matter of days. Everyone can wait days for this. This is no problem at all. I think right now, especially based on the roadblocks, it's going to be mid next week. We'll see this um, start first static fire. The big question is, will they fuel it up again and do a pressure test to do some spin prime tests? Things like that. So their test date might be mid next week, but that test might be just a spin prime test. So that's the thing to watch out for is just in case they don't go for the static fire on the first attempt. So we'll soon find out. I have no doubt we'll be watching it live via Mary. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And we do Maybe. have another Sorry, question. I just, I just... 
Yeah, go ahead. I just had to laugh at like as you were saying that I'm sure we'll be watching it and and like the Raptor install test stand just going sideways. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was just that was just perfect timing. <laughs> Yeah, and we did have another question about that, about I thought they were going to do turbo pump uh, tests first and things like that. Um, the end goal is still, you know, static fire moving into a hop, but there's always steps in between that, you know, they could go uh, progressively. And then the past they've gone, all right, let's do the turbo bump spin prime test. And then as long as that goes well, we'll proceed into static fire. So there's a chance they do it that way. Uh, we don't know, but there might be intermittent steps. Yeah. Um, but then, of course, once the static fire does occur, the next step is going to be that 150 meter hop. And talking about that, if we see static fire happening this coming week, when do you think the schedule for a 150 meter hop test could be? The week after. Yeah. <laughs> That's how SpaceX work. If they get everything they want, data wise, they don't hang around. They don't wait for reviews. They don't wait for NASA reviews because NASA's got nothing to do with this yet. Yet. Um, <laughs> I think it'd be the week after. I really do. I really do think if they find the static fire is providing the data they want and they've got the fuel they want, they've got the vehicle structure data they want, there's no reason why not to, apart from the FAA. But I'm sure I think they've had that before. They've had it approved via the SM4 and even SN2 testings and whatever. They've gone, they've gone further back than that. They've actually asked about the 150 meter hop and it's been approved. So, Providing that's all in place, the paperwork's in place, they're happy with the data, why not the week after? That's what I'd say. Yeah. Well, will there be any preparations that need to happen between a static fire test and hop test? Like any work on the vehicle that we're going to expect to see happen? Uh, unbolt it from the stand, probably, so that it can lift it off. <laughs> that would, that would be it, useful, I would say. <laughs> yeah, it's bolted down to the stand right now, because the launch mount, because obviously static fire is where you bolt it down. Um it would be like a launch pad. It'd be um, literally just a test stand. So they'll be have to, they'll have to unbolt it from the test stand to allow for the hop. That's about it, really. I, I don't know if they've installed the legs or not by now. I think that I think they do install the legs inside. We just don't see them unless we're under, directly underneath the actual Starship. But um, yeah, the pad's there as well. It's, it knows where it's going to. So I like yeah, I, I don't see any real constraints to not allow them to go for the there's legs. So yeah, that goes right into another question we got about will it land on those legs, which have not been tested yet with a landing. We can see some sort of structures in there. It's hard to tell whether that's like the complete leg or like part of the assembly mm. yet, but those legs are going to be tested for the first time on the 150 meter hop test. They're going to fold out from within the thrust skirt. Um, and so that'll be another interesting point to see on that first flight. I don't know if the question was the same question, but the question I saw was what happens if it falls over after it lands on its legs? I would say that's prog progress, would you believe? Yeah, true. Because, yeah. yeah, technically, the way SpaceX works is they did all those tests with Falcon 9 landings. They even made a funny video out of it. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's all about testing. It's the next step along. If this thing yeah. hops 150 meters and comes back down on landing pad and lands on its legs but falls over, that'd be a hell of an achievement, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. That'd be amazing. That's They've got further than they've got before. So I don't think that'd be too terrible. It makes some good headlines yeah, I, and the mass media love it, but no, it would be a good progress. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. no, and, and, I, 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 and I think we will end up getting that, like how not to land your orbital rocket, how not to <laughs> yeah. land your Mars rocket, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. And I know someone asked on Twitter and Elon said he was going to, there was going to be a blooper reel of Raptor development at some point, And I'm going to make sure we hold that to him. Cause I want to see Raptors explode nice. on the test stand. All right. Yeah. So, and that will be how not to develop a Mars engine or something like that. So, yeah. but yeah, you know, SpaceX is not afraid to, you know, fail spectacularly because it gets them farther and farther and that's how you progress. So, uh, yeah. even if that happens 100% still a step forward. Uh, we've got a super chat from CS. Thank you so much for your support. We appreciate it. Um, let's go to some more questions here. Oh, we got a question about Zeus, and someone asked us to show Zeus footage earlier, so we're going to do that. Uh, Dylan, what's the no? Do we know if Elon will release Zeus's footage of the cryo tests? No. Um, no, 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 we don't. But, um, I mean... <laughs> The, 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 video, the videos we get are kind of like it, it's just kind of like when, when they wish to release things um, so I, I, I wouldn't necessarily say we'll ever get to see it but I wouldn't rule it out because mm -hmm. it is Elon and he likes to share cool things um, it's my answer <laughs> speaking of cool things watch this 
Yeah, the, 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 so oh, for yeah. those who might not be familiar, I did some research because these things are fascinating to me. So this company called Boston Dynamics makes these little robots that can carry you know, sorts of sensors and things like that. And SpaceX appears to have gotten one to help inspect the test site um, before they can clear the pad and let personnel get there. So it's got a camera on there, it's got sensors, it's got a microphone, all that, that kind of stuff. And it's super interesting. And we saw, finally, Mary got a view of the robot. Uh, being worked on with a uh, SpaceXer, and he's kind of put it into this little dog house because it's sort of supposed to be like a little robot dog. And it's so cool to finally see this. It's awesome. I love that they painted it the Snoopy dog house. Too. It's this so is awesome. what they're going to reverse the uh, dog into the kennel now because it's time for it to go to bed. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. So hopefully, but it would be cool to see that unique view of. Um, the, of like post cryo test or things like that. I know there was video at one point of you know sort of the snow falling from underneath the thrust skirt uh, during a cryo yeah. test or something. I know that's come out at some point, so it'd be awesome uh, if we could get a view of that uh, from Zeus here. Um, but let's see some other questions here. Um, <laughs> there it goes. Yep, there you go. It's so cool. <laughs> Little dance. If you want to see more footage of these robots doing weird and awesome stuff, just Google Boston Dynamics Spot, and that's the name of the uh, the like the Robo Dog, and it's so cool. I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure the T-shirt's not centered; it's just some strange kind yeah, of effect going. Yeah, on. I'm wondering if because I'm pretty sure in the original vid that shirt's green. I wonder if there's some weird green skin thing going on in our production <laughs> yeah. that's making the it's, shirt look it, great. The T-shirt said Ad Astra, so it's, it's fine. It's actually a very good. T-shirt. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. Uh, but we got a question here. When do you think that SpaceX will be done constructing the high bay and start constructing the first super heavy booster? <laughs> uh, next year. I I'm, could... I'm, I'm, I'm being conservative, I know, but I think the high bay is going to take quite a long time to construct. I think probably two months to finish it as far as internal structures go, what have you. And then, oh, I don't know. It could be this year, but we're in July now. July, August, September. <sighs> It could be this year. It's it's very hard. We don't know. I think the, the best way to answer that is we don't know, but it could be this year. It probably yeah. is next year. Let's go with that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Do. Um, yeah. I I I think I would agree with that. Um, just in general, like like there is a desire to move quickly, but as as we're seeing, they're not they're not just going quick for the sake of going quick, you know. And and I think that's an important. Um, I think that's an important part of this right and, and elon and gwen have both been very um upfront about the fact that you know here's the when we say schedules we mean best case scenario nothing goes wrong so yeah, yeah i think late maybe later this year but next year we'll see a super heavy yeah, and I've been saying for a little bit that I don't think an orbital test flight Starship could happen this year. I mean, y yes, technically it could, but I've been saying like next year is a much more reasonable estimate. The question is, though, will Super Heavy fly on its own sort of grasshopper style before it launches a Starship spacecraft? Would that make sense? What do you think? Well, um, uh, would it be able to fly uh, that? Well, I mean, it needs a can. It doesn't need canyards on the Starship part to basically yeah. function as a fly. I know you're talking I mean, about I'm, hop, don't you? You're talking about a hop. That's yeah, I'm talking about a short hop yeah, test, yeah. like sort of like the Starship prototypes, which now, like, you know, this 150 meter yeah. hop won't have aero services or anything. So I'm imagining a Super Heavy doing that um, because, I mean, the big part, the big difference will be it's going to be flying under the power of more Raptor engines just because it's going to be heavier. Yeah. So like a landing burn with, you know, a cluster of Raptors firing, stuff like that, they might want to test with a short hop test. Um, that's just I, I, could, I could, I could... I, I could see that, but but I think any anything higher than like 150 meter, you know, just to right. keep it in line with, with the rest of the test sequence, I think anything higher than that, you run into really bad aerodynamic. Right, yeah, totally. Uh, like rip the vehicle apart aerodynamic loads um, if it doesn't have its nose cone, which is Starship. Right, so, exactly. The, the thing that interests me the most is the fact that we've heard what one Raptor sounds like mm -hmm. in Mary's oh. videos. It's loud. So what the heck? It's super heavy going to be like Art. when it was a static fire. <laughs> it's going to be waking up Mercer, Texas. <laughs> All of the microphones are just going to be maxed out. We're not even going to be able to tell what's going yeah. on. <laughs> it's going to be like my. It's going to be like my yell when Bob and Doug launch. Right, out. exactly. It's going to be the exact same thing. Uh, well, so here we go. Jay's got a question. How do you think they will handle thirty-one plus Raptors? I mean, that's what we're looking at for super heavy, and so Starship already sound suppression. 
So a lot of sound out. suppression water system. Um, there's, I mean, Starship itself already is going to be powered by seven Raptor engines at some point, once it's, you know, a full stack operation. So, and that's already a lot of engines, but Falcon 9's got nine engines, Falcon Heavy's got 27, so they have experience with late, big clusters of engines. Um, yeah. Obviously, there's a bit more engines and bigger engine when you go to Raptor, but they have experience in the area. Well, and, and, and one thing to remember, too, in terms of, like, how they're handling them and how they're arriving at 31, one thing SpaceX is always really big out is engine multiple engine out capability, where the mission is still delivered successful. Um, so, so you can see, like, even with Falcon 9, I think they've said um, they can lift off with two engines out, so only seven of the nine. Haha, <laughs> seven of nine. Uh, only seven of the nine firing at liftoff and still complete a mission. Now, they might not be able to affect recovery depending on which engines those are, but they can still deliver a mission successfully with less than the full complement. And right. I can't imagine that not transferring to Starship. And I think 31 is the end goal. I think they're going to do yes. versions of Super Heavy with less engines, but when I say less engines, we're still talking about probably 20 odd plus. Uh, it's a lot of engines, a lot of Raptors as well. Uh before we continue with the Matt's Q&A, we've got a mini bit of breaking news here. Dust is going to bring up a tweet from William Harward, CBS Space News. Static fire has occurred for the next oh, Falcon 9 no. mission. A NASA's booster has fired up over at Pad 40. Again, we think that's B-1058, uh, the Demo-2 booster. So that's another big step. We're going to wait for SpaceX to confirm that the test was successful and confirm the launch target, but that should be on the 14th, just nine minutes after the uh, Hope uh, Mars mission from Japan. Um, so that's a big step forward in that launch campaign. So uh, there you I'll, go, some breaking I'll, news. I'm going to be annoying and just um, give you a little side story, but Bill Harwood's a real nice guy. He was one of the few people who talked to me when I first started to site, because obviously when you first started to site, who are you? And I don't blame mm -hmm. people for thinking that. He was lovely from the start, so he's, he's a great guy and a very good reporter. He very he really, really is, mm. really is. Um, so, retweets, one, one thing retweets. I want to mention, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One thing I did want to mention about, about this mission, uh, just to start preparing people, um, this has a long window. So it's not like the ones we, we've become used to with SpaceX here in the last few months. Um, the window opens at um, 1700 EDT and closes at 2055. So we have a um, so 5, 5 p.m. local to 8.55 p.m. local um, is the launch window. So we have a very nice long window, which makes that 70% chance of violation dropping to only a 50% chance of violation as we move through the window makes that more dynamic because they do have the whole window. So they'll obviously come in that day and start with an aim to go at the opening of the window, and then it'll just be weather calls and weather evaluations on the 14th. So just prep for that now, but we've got a nice big window. And that is a big caveat to the whole launching nine minutes after the H2A launch because they could, you know, the H2A launch is going to have an instantaneous window, right? Uh, yes, because of H2A performance margins, yes. Okay, so that'll ha launch at that time or have to be delayed to another day. But if it launches on the 14th, it will be at that exact time, whereas Falcon 9 is going to have a nice long window for the Anasis mission. So it could happen a couple hours at later. Um, but if it launches at the opening of the window, it would be a very tight two rockets and powered flight at once phase. So that would be cool. But let's go back it, it, to... It, it really uh, would, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I remember, I think last year, there was a race between an H2A an Ariane 5 and a Falcon 9, or there were like three going at once, and that was insane. Um, so cool stuff we, like that. We, we've, yeah, we've had Japan and we've had H2A and Falcon 9 missions overlap before mm -hmm. um, in terms of both being empowered ascent at the same yeah. time. So let's go back into some more Max Q&A. We've got some more Starship questions. If you got questions about other stuff too, feel free to throw them in the chat. We're kind of in a phase of ask anything you'd like. Um, but lots of questions about Starship, so we'll keep that going. Um, a question from Carl about the new test stand. Do you think that the new stand will be a spare for the current one in case of a explosion, or is it meant as a separate test stand to operate side by side? Isn't that the previously damaged test stand? That they're now on the new test stand itself with Starship, and that is the previous. I'm, I don't know, I might be wrong. I think that is the previous test stand that had a, the um, the failure suffer on it, and they've basically just turned it upside down and repairing it to be the spare test stand. I think that's what I remember anyway. Someone correct that, me if I'm wrong. That, that matches my memory too, but I I can't. As soon as you second guess yourself, I second guess myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, either way, either way, it's a spare test stand, so we know right. that much. Yeah. 
Um, let's move along to comments about the stainless steel. Are there any updates on SpaceX's own custom 30X steel alloy? We know right now they're using 304L, yeah. which is closer to the final alloy that they want to use, but it's not quite there yet. Any updates on that more final version? Not yet. I, it, we know that they've got yeah. SN5 and SN6 made from 301L. We know that SN8 or SN7 test tank will be like the previous test tank, which will be 304L. And we know that the future Starship with 304L until further notice. We've seen no sign of a different kind of steel turn up yet. We do know that they're working on the 301 x which is their own company version of the alloy. Um, but we've not heard anything since from Elon. I think as soon as they have the alloy ready to go and to be welded and used into steel rings, he'll probably say something. So it might be a while off, but I think 304L has proven its worth already with the tests. So I think that'll be the one for at least test flights. Mm hmm yeah, I mean, you got you got to admire the the 304L already, where it it they did pressurize it to failure once, but it wasn't the failure they wanted to see, so they just yeah. patched it and did it again right. until it really let loose. I mean, but but that really speaks to how strong that 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 steel is, and and how it, and the good move it was to to switch. All right, let's move right along. Uh, we've got another question here about the schedule. Uh, what is the hop progression like? How many intermediate steps will there be between 150 meters and the big altitude 20 kilometer hop? See, that's a good question. Uh, everyone thinks, and yeah. a lot of people rightly think, it's 150 meter hop and then it stretches to 20 kilometer test flight. I, I really do think um, there will be intermediate hops. And the question now is, will it be with SM5? Let's pretend SM5 hops, 150 meter hops, and it lands perfectly well on the landing pad do they then refuel it put it back on the launch uh, put it back on the launch pad refuel it and then launch even higher i wouldn't for, blame for sn5 that. so you know you never know but i, I, I think there will be intermediate steps I, I really do i think 150 meter hot to 20 kilometer test flight is a big jump and i think they'd want to just try and get like 500 meters and see how it performs on that get some duration out of the raptor see how it does with that and then they'll be more confident to try with the yeah, 20 kilometer test flight because and, if that fails it'd be quite spectacular yeah and i'm and i'm also remembering too that there was a that there was an ongoing conversation something that that the i believe it was from the faa that kind of gave away that they were already thinking about a two or three kilometer yeah three, I, kilometer, the, yeah. three, three uh, kilometers in my head i might have been an fcc thing or something because yeah, they usually kilometers. specify yeah, like what the permits yeah. for yeah and 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 which would make a lot of sense and i'm i'm with you chris if 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 uh, i don't actually expect sn5 to survive the necessarily all throughout all of its testing but like if the 150 meter hop goes well because they're just literally going up translating deploy landing legs and come back down um which is a bit more complication than than with um star hopper but I, I mean if they if they get it back from the 100 meter hop why not haul it back to the pad and put it there and go again yeah. All right, they, well, we know they like to reuse things. I'm going to go out on a limb and actually disagree with both of my bosses at once right what? now. But I, I, <laughs> you know, I, I think, in my head, I'm thinking, because the 150 meter up is nice and low altitude, low speed, doesn't need any of the aero surfaces. But I think when they start to get much higher than that, you start to run into the point where you're going to want more aerodynamic stability. So in, my prediction is going to be SN5 gets the 150 meter hop. Hopefully it goes well. Um, and, I, and I'm pretty confident in that because Starhopper did a 150 meter hop well. Yeah. So the only thing you're changing is the scale of the vehicle. You're doing the same test flight profile. Um, so I, 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 hopefully that that can go well. Um, and if, but if they do do that, I'm gonna guess that they go to a next vehicle with some aero services for a next test flight. That would probably, you know, they might do 150 meters with that other one with all the aero services and then move into a three kilometer or something like that. Uh, but my guess is SN5 finishes with a 150 meter hop. That's fair because he, yeah, yeah, I didn't didn't appreciate the nurse code, yeah. the canyons, and the aero services which would be needed. And I, I thought maybe they'd install it on SM5, but maybe not. I mean, it makes more sense to to um, install it on the vehicle they're going to fly with properly to the flight height. So, well, yeah, we'll see. I think the way we'll watch that one is what they do with the nurse cones because they've got so many nurse cones in the production area. It's ridiculous. They've got about seven nurse cones. <laughs> they've got more nurse cones than actual starships uh, they might have a few spare ones to stick on SM5 you never know we'll see what happens alright we've got a question Wait, about there. launch pads here Ron Smith wants to know which super heavy pad will be completed first the one at Kennedy Space Center Launch Complex 39A or the one in Boca Chica 
I'm, oh, I'm... the one in Boca Chica, because yeah. they've been very clear that it flies from there first. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting question, though, because the 39A Starship Super Heavy Pod has really making good progress. It ready to right. get far, but then COVID Like, happened, currently, and... the one at KSC is farther along, is it not? Yeah, technically, it is, because it... it's got its ah! on it. But, yeah, it's, it's just a question of getting that far, sir. It's, um, they stop work on it, and everything concentrated on Boca Chica, so that's what's happened. We've, we've moved into Boca yeah. Chica. Yeah. Yeah, I and 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 since that the the, the transition to Boca Chica, it, it the, there has been some progress made. I mean, COVID has definitely taken its toll on it. But um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, in terms of what's there, um, yeah, I don't really know how to classify which one's farther along because there's a lot of stuff that you have to build brand new at Boca Chica that 39A already has. That's um, true. So it it is a little difficult to do a direct comparison between the build of the launch pads at each site what what i can tell you is that like the sound suppression water piping is here at kennedy the big flame deflector and one half of the mount ring on the base of the pad is up at 39a already um and and the flame deflector is taller than the base than, than how high the the pad at 39a rises from the local terrain yeah. it's insane how tall this thing is already but yeah that's where they are in terms of the build at Kennedy. Well, there we go. And we're going to wrap this up with some max Q&A. We got some non-Starship questions that I want to run through. And the first one is actually pretty interesting. Leon wants to know, would an electron rocket have the amount of Delta V to go to the moon? And I believe NASA and Rocket Lab have already answered that question for us, haven't they? They have indeed, because they have contracted with Rocket Lab to launch a mission to the moon. Um, uh, it will launch from uh, the Wallops range, the NASA controlled range here um, from Virginia at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport. Um, and yes, I believe it has to use, and, and, and it will use the Electron first stage, the second stage, the Curie kick stage, and then I believe it has something else too. Um, does it have a fourth, do, like another kick stage? Does it? Or, or I, doesn't it go on the photon base? Like, is, isn't it going yeah, on I the think photon was, base thing from there? So Electron has their photon satellite bus, and I'm uh, admittedly a little rusty on this so there's the photon satellite bus which i think is based on the curie powered kick stage but they're two different things i think they are, yes but but i think so they it might be uh you know the first and second stage of electron and then a photon satellite bus hosting the it's called the capstone mission um as yeah. its kick stage i don't know if there's two stages after the main electron stages i think there's just the three total um, but i could be wrong but there's a, a confusion about what exactly they'll be there but regardless the entire yeah. launch system is going to launch a mission to lunar... Is it lunar flyby or lunar orbit? Yep, good question. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, uh, and, that's when, and that's when I realized I've only ever heard it referred to as mission to the moon, so I don't know how to answer that. Um. <laughs> if, it's, if it's a p payload hosted on like the photon satellite bus that Electron made, it would make sense that it could insert itself into lunar orbit. If it's just a kick stage that's right. deploying like a CubeSat, the CubeSat right, likely won't have enough propulsion to do orbital insertion. Well, uh, well, up someone just I mean, said... Like, oh, okay, there we go. Electron... Yeah, go ahead. I've got an answer. Ian Atkinson in the background says it's going to the gateway Perfect. orbit, so it's going to insert itself into lunar orbit. So okay. there you go. Okay. Um, so that, yeah. and I, if I had to guess, that would mean it's going to use sort of the photon bus to do that. And and that would make a lot of sense because you could you could do the regular standard electron, you could do a Curie kick stage to to get you more performance margin out of that and get you into a higher orbit and then it would make sense to use the photon one because then you could do very low thrust low energy burns and do a spiral out um until you hit the correct transfer point right and then you know and, and you can take a few months to get there um so yeah all right, well, so there you go. There is your question about Electron. And unfortunately, I do have a couple questions left, but we really are running out of time. Um, if you still want to get your questions answered, you can see our Twitter handles near the bottom of your screen right now. Please feel free to send those questions to us on Twitter, and we'd be happy to talk space for you after the show. Um, but for right now, we're going to go wrap up this week's edition of the show. I want to thank all of the channel memberships that are joining the channel and supporting our channel. You've seen our launch directors and flight engineers, as well as all of our other um, uh, 
mem channel membership tiers thank you so much for all of your support this is how we get to continue improving our boca chica coverage our launch coverage from cape canaveral and vandenberg things like that this is how we get to do what we do and we greatly appreciate all of your support including all of these super chats that come in during these live streams as well so we greatly appreciate that again my name is thomas burkhardt i am a writer and reporter for nasa's place flight and i'm joined by the two chris's chris bergen uh, founder and managing editor of nasa space flight and chris Gebhardt, Assistant Managing Editor. Um, if you would like to follow us on social media, our handles are right below us on your screen. Go ahead and check us out. And of course, if you have more questions, please send them there. We'll be happy to answer them. But uh, thank you guys Thomas, for joining I've to, me. I've got to say one quick thing. One quick thing. So since you disagreed with both of your bosses live <laughs> on air, I, I need to remind you of the 33rd rule of acquisition. <laughs> it never hurts to suck up to the boss. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. So how about you all go follow my bosses on Twitter and maybe that'll lessen the, <laughs> the blow after this. But thank you guys so much for tuning in. Um, yeah, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, until next week, uh, NASA Space Flight Live signing off. We'll see you guys next time. Pressure looks good.